Well, I, I think uh, in, from the U.S. perspective, uh, a lot of the push in this direction is born out of, um, well, again, as I described, first of all, it kind of started in the foreign policy arena. So it didn't start in the security realm. It started with the idea that we have some big issues, problems out there, and um, the U.S. wants to kind of leverage the international diplomatic strength of uh, Japan and its financial strength and capability, uh, and Australia's, uh, you know, I think really punches above its weight and the idea in, in, in that realm from a U.S. perspective, and it was deeply involved in Afghanistan and also uh, in Iraq as well, and they could be brought into the, 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 the North Korean situation. Australia is a sending state to the UN command. There are all these different connections, and I think the idea was we need to, to raise the level of consultation uh, uh, to, to, to a higher level and think more strategically long-term about how we can try to shape this region. In, in a sense, it's, it's, it's the rebalance before the rebalance ever had a name to it, which was already starting in the Bush administration, I think, which is recognizing the importance of Asia and, and the role of these different players. And it's an element of you know, something that we call a little bit leading from behind or the rise of the rest or this idea that, that we need other countries um, that think like us and, and want a similar uh, future uh, to, to help build this, um, th this infrastructure, this architecture. So the security piece came then more functionally as, as a derivative from that, I think, in terms of counterproliferation and maritime security. And, and, um, and then there is, so there is a desire to uh, develop more effective multilateral co uh, coalition operations, Indian Ocean, counter piracy in the Gulf of Aden, some of these stability operations. And I think we recognize the different skills that each country brings or in the legal limitations. So we don't ask the same things of the Japanese that we do expect from the Australians, but this has been an effort to try to, especially in the airlift side in the beginning, and, and uh, Japan has one of the world's largest inventories of CH-47 helicopters, which are incredibly useful in a variety of international operations, but they have no means to get them to the, to the place where we might want them in the Pakistan floods or the uh, uh, Pakistan earthquake, etc., and so Australia has some of these capabilities, so can't we utilize it? So I think the U.S. is coming at it on the security side from a very practical, enabling, operationalizing kind of, of of expectation, and and in some ways trying to avoid the broader implications of, of, of developing a a, a, um, a coalition against something, and and really trying to uh, to to drive it in that that direction. Well, when we compare our relationship with the United States and, and Australia, I think we, we have a completely different uh, dynamics in terms of the defense um, cooperation. Um, United States and Japan is obviously the allies, uh, you know, title with the Article 5 issues, extended deterrence was there, and we are now currently revising the defense cooperation guidelines uh, and how uh, those schemes could be uh, rebuilt uh, in, in countering the new situation. For relation with Australia, we are not nearly close to the, you know, having a, a mutual defense uh, 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 cooperation issue. But I think we are currently have, uh, you know, best uh, label as, the, uh, you know, the strategic partner, uh, which uh, cooperate together for regional order building and also contributing the global uh, issues uh, as well. So, uh, and then embark on the specific, uh, you know, uh, cooperation items, uh, as I described, uh, towards like a you know, capacity building in mutual states, and also the technological cooperation uh, as such. And in that terms, that uh, we have a very different dimension of the relationship in terms of. But I, if I may, uh, speak on the you know en entrapment, uh, you know, uh, um, abandonment dynamics between Japan and the United States. Uh, one of uh, the new logic that we encounter is that. Uh, when we had a, you know, the current uh, drafting of the J uh, Japan U.S. Co defense cooperation guideline, that the major issue obviously was the Korean Peninsula and also the Taiwan Strait. So that the basic logic that we had is how much we can really cooperate towards the U.S. engagement to such kind of a contingency. So the real area support, logistic support, and how much item that we can really offer uh, was the major uh, issue there. But today, I think we have uh, two 
new domains uh, in, uh, in this dynamism. Number one is the emerging concept of uh, what we call the gray zone uh, issues, um, and the Senkaku Southwestern Island chain. Uh, and that case that we want United States to be visibly uh, involved. Uh, and that's why in the interim report says that United States and Japan will deal with the seamlessly and all phases uh, in a force, such kind of sequences of the escalation uh, management. Because that uh, if we try to detach the gray zone into the Japan-China bilateral dynamics, that's where China wants to expand that framework to change the status quo without uh, crossing the threshold uh, towards the general war. But if China thinks that this is the domain where Japanese Coast Guard and law enforcement uh, in activities play the primary role, but you feel that this is connected deeply with the alliance dynamics, that is a very, I think, important way that we should, I wouldn't say entrap, but to engage the United States from the day one uh, in, the, in the gray zone. That's what I think we are aiming at uh, for the uh, you know, revised uh, you know, defense cooperation guideline. And the second, I think, for, from the U.S. perspective, that the emerging another domain is the growing um, anti-access and uh, area denial uh, environment, and how much that the location uh, of Japan, which is, you know, huge proximity uh, to to those uh, Chinese new uh, capability, would have a strategic kind of importance. And for us, uh, I think it is very important that the United States uh, conventional forces uh, being available in the Japanese soil, which is most, I think, symbolic of extended deterrence uh, for, for securing Japan and also uh, uh, in uh, Northeast Asia. But in that case, that we have to emphasize that such kind of stationing of forces is logical and, uh, you know, in, in, in it's, it's effi you know, efficient in terms of the cost-benefit analysis of the U.S. war presence uh, strategy. So um, how much we can really offer like uh, resiliency functions uh, for stationing forces by hardening of the bases, dis dispersal options, and the supporting operation by the SDF uh, could be one of the very important uh, way uh, to uh, encourage the United States to stay uh, in Japan. So that these kind of dynamics are something new uh, uh, which we really have to emphasize in the, in the guideline process. David? Thank you. Um, I think uh, Australia uh, has long seen and still sees the United States as a great stabilizer in, in the Asia Pacific in terms of underpinning security throughout out the region. And Australia remains positive about that role that the United States um, uh, can play uh, in the region. In this sense, Australia is, uh, has, shares, I, I think, similarities with quite a number of countries uh, around, around the region. Australia sees uh, cooperating with the United States uh, in that sense uh, as benefiting Australia and, and, and the region. Uh, in terms of Japan, I, I think uh, by comparison the strategic issues that Australia faces are, are, are less acute. Uh, but again, I think uh, as uh, an ally of the United States, Japan is, is uh, clearly uh, a promising um, security partner for Australia and again as a stabilising uh, role in the region. Australia's uh, prosperity uh, during and since the Cold War is, is, has been closely aligned um, with this stability. Uh, and so the maintenance of this stability, I think Australia sees as both in its national interest, but for the wider uh, good of the Asia Pacific. 